Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Jane Fowler, and a very warm welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. It's great to see that the main theatre is packed. Thank you to our sponsor, the New York Times. We're joined by a writer whose book, latest book, has been a Sunday Times bestseller for the last few months. It's a great privilege to introduce Philippa Perry. Hello. <laughs> Philippa Perry has been a psychotherapist for the last 20 years. She's the author of Couch Fiction, a graphic tale of psychotherapy, and How to Stay Sane. She's an agony aunt for Red Magazine, a freelance writer, and a television and radio presenter. Her latest work comes with the inspired title, The Book You Wish Your Parents Had Read and Your Children Will Be Glad That You Did. If you are of a certain age and were brought up in Scotland, parents didn't make mistakes. Parents were perfect and to be respected at all costs. The biggest crime that hovered over childhood was the risk of being spoiled. That way lay ruin. As the writer Janice Galloway says, the worst thing ever was to get above yourself. Younger parents have tried to adopt a more easygoing style, but often with sudden bursts of discipline when everything else fails. Do it! Do it now! And all the while, that dreaded phrase, waiting in the wings, I blame the parents. Philippa Perry's book is about how we were brought up and how that has a bearing on how we parent, about the mistakes we'll make and what to do about them. It stresses that the core of parenting is the relationship you have with your children. Their feelings matter. It brings empathy and compassion to the fore. It's a book that makes you think whether you're a parent, a grandparent, or a fellow traveler. Please welcome Philippa Perry. I'm just going to have a look at you. <laughs> how, many, how many psychotherapists have I got in today? Ah, uh, some over here. Right. You'll, you'll let me know when I go wrong. Good. When I, when I get it wrong. Um, how many people are expect who aren't parents yet but are expecting to be parents are here today what <laughs> you're all too scared to take that step well i, I hope, hope you won't be after after hearing what i'm going to say as jane has said the most important thing in anyone's life is their relationship with the people who are responsible for caring for them and bringing them up. That's usually the parents, but it could be guardians, it, it could be um, grandparents. It's, it's the child's significant others, so it's their immediate family. And these relationships are more important than anything else for a child. If you feel secure in these earliest of relationships with your parents, possibly your siblings, with your carers, oops, shoelace, my <laughs> mum wasn't looking after me this morning, was she? <laughs> um, if you feel secure and safe in that relationship, good things happen. And the good things are that you can confide any feeling with your primary carers so that you don't feel alone. Another good thing that happens is if you feel secure and certain of that relationship, you don't obsess about it. You don't think, oh, God, I hope mum's in a good mood or anything like that. And so that gives you space to be curious about the world, which means that helps you learn. And if you have a good primary relationship, it also means that's your blueprint for future relationships. And so if you go into the world more ready to trust than distrust, you tend to have a better time of it. And the most important thing in a working life is probably 
being able to do relationships. And it's certainly the most important thing in a personal life and for a, um, a satisfying life is to have relationships, easy relationships, that we can sort of take for granted. And the blueprint for those relationships comes from the earliest relationship you have with your caregiver. So that's pretty simple then. Be nice. <laughs> Be nice to your kid. That's all you have to do. See things from their point of view as well as your own. Be fair. Be kind. Be gentle. Be present. Be warm. Be interested. Nothing to... I don't know what we're here for. I mean, <laughs> what... what? Ah, uh, yeah, I just remembered. Why we're here is because something seems to go wrong. We don't want to lose our patience, but we do. We don't want to parent how we were parented, but somehow we open our mouths and our father's words fly out. <laughs> don't do as I say, do as I do or whatever they happen to be. And this is because under stress, and it is stressful having three children under five, under stress, what happens is that we revert to very old patterns rather than the ones we're trying to create and think about. So we tend to parent whatever our intentions are in the way we were parented. And a good way and which, if you know, you're brought up to feel like you were a valuable member of the community, is, is fine. But if you're brought up to think you're probably a bit of a nuisance and always get things wrong, it's not great to pass those, those things on. And so it's quite important to look at how you were brought up, what worked for you, what didn't work for you, and what worked for you might not work for your kid because they are a different person to you. So what made you feel safe might not make them feel safe. So what we have to do is look at each child individually and have an individual relationship with each child. They are not like gummy bears. They are individual individuals, and they require an individual relationship with each child, obviously. Anyway, what else am I going to talk about? Yeah, so children need a parent that they can confide in and not hide from. Now, a big thing in getting this relationship right comes under the um, heading of feelings. Now, we all think we're pretty good with knowing what we're feeling, knowing what the kid's feeling, maybe even trying to soothe the child when they're, when they're feeling... Um, um, overstimulated or, 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 or desperate or really unhappy or lonely, we're quite good at going there, there, which is good. We should go there, 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 there. It's nice if someone can contain all those feelings and not be upset by them and uh, we feel that our parents are a safe container for all our feelings that appear to, to get too much for us. Um, so we're quite good about these feelings and soothing the child. And you learn to soothe yourself in relationship with others. Um, so if your parents can soothe you, you learn to internalize that soothing. And that's how you learn to self-soothe. And it takes years. So you will keep bursting into tears about three times a day till you're about five or six. And then you'll find you go whole days without crying because you've internalized some of that it feels bad now, but it's going to get better soon sort of feeling. Um, what we're not so good at is once a kid learns to talk, we tend to listen to what they're saying and give that sort of priority over what they might be feeling. And so we tend to answer their words and leave their feelings unanswered. I'll give you some examples. Um, let me think of an example. <laughs> Mummy, there is monsters under my bed. Now, it's quite easy at this point to look under the bed and go, uh-uh, no monsters. 
But what we need to do is actually hear what the child wants, which might be, I want you not to leave the room, because they don't want to say, I want not to leave the room, because you're just going to go anyway. But you've got to hear what they're really saying when they're talking about monsters under the bed. So, you know, you sound scared, or you sound lonely, and then speak back not to the monsters, but to the feeling that the monsters represent. And then they'll f still get that holding, containing feeling that you could give them when they were just crying anyway. Um, when the child gets a bit older, they'll sound almost rational, but they'll say something really daft. So suppose um, you give up a day to go to a theme park, OK? What's the local theme park in Edinburgh that you take children to? You haven't got one. That's amazing. <laughs> you, have, you have saved yourself so much pain. Uh, yeah, never mind. Anyway, suppose you did take your child to a theme park then. And, um, and, and the next day, you're, you're catching up on your spreadsheets or whatever you do during the day. And your child comes, goes in and goes, I'm bored. We never go out. You have spent the whole of yesterday at Legoland. <laughs> you have queued for rides. You have paid for burgers. You have worn your feet down. You took three other children as well. <laughs> it is a saint that doesn't say at this point, I think you'll find we went to Legoland yesterday. <laughs> However, what the child is really saying is, I'm bored and I don't know what to do. So find your saintly side when they go, we never go out and go, you sound bored and fed up, what would you like to do? And the child will probably reply something like, I want to go back to Legoland again. And then you can say, yeah, that was fun, wasn't it? And then you have a moment of connection. And this is what we all need throughout our lives, and especially when we're children, are these moments of connection when we, felt we feel seen and we feel understood. So if you start having a row saying, we went out yesterday, yeah, but we're not going out today, are we? You don't get that moment of connection, and that's what actually you both need at that time. So listen to what the child is feeling as well as what they're saying, and respond to the feeling first. You sound bored and fed up rather than, yes, we do go to Legoland or whatever it is. So that's really important to keep hearing the feelings even after we have words. And you might know yourself that sometimes it's really difficult to put your inchoate feelings into words. I mean, even poets find it hard. So of course our children are going to find it really hard to do that. So it's our job to listen out for the feelings and validate the feelings. Because if you have your feelings validated, you are unlikely, less likely even perhaps, to need 20 years of therapy later on, <laughs> getting your, your, which is what I had, getting your you know, feelings put into words for you. Um, monsters under the bed. Oh yeah, another thing that us good parents always get wrong is that we want our child to be happy all the time. What a pressure. Not allowed to be anything but happy. And what we tend to do is sort of go, ah, when they're happy because we like it. And then when they're not happy, they don't get such a warm, fuzzy response all the time. Like, we're not so good when they're angry, or we're not so good when they're desperate. So what happens is a child tends to hide that part of themselves. They learn to adapt over the years. And then these bits of them, they feel aren't good because they've not been mirrored by us as parents. And so they feel like they've got some bad bits in them because they haven't had their, what we might call, negative feelings mirrored. Now, there are no such things as negative feelings. We need the full spectrum of super-duper happy to very, very not okay. We need all those feelings so that we know what we want in life. So, you know, we need to feel 
say lonely because loneliness is a feeling like hunger, is a, is a feeling like pain that we need to do something about to keep ourselves fit, alive and happy. So these negative feelings need as much holding and containing and witnessing as the happy ones. Because if we have our so-called negative feelings seen, heard and understood, we feel seen, heard and understood, which gives us the capacity for happiness. So when a kid is miserable, try and be with them in their misery so they don't feel alone with it rather than trying to distract them from it. I mean, if, for instance, daddy goes out to work and the kid is absolutely beside themselves because the person they love more than anything in the world seems to have left them. Imagine that feels awful, especially as a day for them is as long as a year is for us. So they feel terrible about that. So what they need is the, the carer or the remaining parent to be with them while they're unhappy. Yes, you're unhappy because daddy's gone to work. That is a shame. Yes, he will be back by tea time. Yes, that does feel like a long time. And when the child feels seen and heard and understood, then you can suggest another activity, but not straight away because then they feel that part of them is bad and gets pushed away. Um, what else have we got here? It's really important to, with very little kids, to respect them. They're not it's, they're, they're people. And we can respect them in several ways. One of the ways is to allow dialogue to develop, which means turn-taking. We are naturally, biologically, geared up for turn-taking. So even labour itself is a matter of being, you know, squeezed out, rest, squeezed out, rest. It's, it's, it's turn-taking. And then when you hold a tiny little baby up and, and you make faces with them, you will naturally, without thinking about it, take turns. Now, we're quite good at that with tiny, tiny, tiny little babies, but we need not to lose it. We need to leave the space to observe the child and then carry on with the dialogue, carry on with the turn-taking, because that is the precursor for conversation. And once we get into the talking stage and in conversation, we still need to talk with rather than talk at. It's so easy in a parent-child relationship to get stuck in a doer done to dynamic, which we don't want because none of us want to be done to. We want to be, we want to have a dialogue with rather than having things or words done to us. If we do to children, that's the dynamic they pick up and then we might find ourselves on the other side of the done to dynamic. Respect also means um, telling the little baby what you're going to do before you do it. So you say, I'm going to change your nappy. And then you wait. And then after about six months and you say, I'm going to change your nappy, they'll, they'll start to put their legs up and they'll start to cooperate because they will start to understand what those words mean. So we must always talk to them from the very beginning and keep talking. Uh, so we don't just grab them out of the pushchair and shove them in the car seat. We go, I'm going to unbuckle you. I'm going to lift you up now and leave a space before you do lift and do put them up. It just makes things a lot easier. I was at the airport yesterday and I saw a lovely little toddler toddling. This is how toddlers tend to toddle, like that. And a delighted mum came up behind him and swooped him up because she loved him so much. She just swooped him up and then he cried. And I think he was crying because, first of all, he was enjoying toddling off. And secondly, that was a shock. He hadn't been prepared for this swoop. Had she come round the other side and said, I'm going to pick you up now, he would have been prepared and it wouldn't have been such a shock, and we wouldn't have had so many tears, perhaps. Um, so I asked if anybody was expecting a baby or expecting to have one, and nobody said no, so I'm going to skip the pregnancy bit. 
I'm going to skip the bit about sympathetic magic, um, and I'm going to go straight to coercive cries. In the olden days, we used to think that that cry from a baby that pierced our heart was best left alone to train them that they can't be boss. What we do is we're training them to be insecure, training them to find more devious ways of getting attention, and training them to be a pain in the ass, basically. <laughs> you cannot spoil a child with too much attuned attention. Coercive uh, what a coercive cry means, all mammals have them. So if a lion at attacks a herd of zebras, a zebra will make, one zebra will see the lion and make the call and then they'll all respond to it. They won't be able to help. You know when you hear that cry, you have that instinct. That's how we've stayed alive for the 200,000 years we've stayed alive for. So we really need to answer those coercive cries and not go against our instincts. Um, right. Um, Behaviour. Mm. We all want people to behave in, in, in a convenient way so we can all get along nicely in society. And we tend to think there's two ways that we can train a kid to behave. And that is we can be dominant and insistent and disciplined, or we can be lax. But both those ways don't really work. If we are just really strict, we'll, ki we'll teach our kid, hi, yay, hi, we'll teach our kid to be inflexible and stubborn. And then we get into standoff, and then we get into winning and losing, which isn't desirable. So what we want is more of a collaboration which is sort of going back to that feeling of dialogue again. If you get in the habit of this dialogue, you'll be able to collaborate a lot easier. So what collaboration looks like is if you have the very strict, which is, you must tidy your room. And then you have lax, which is, huh, floor drobe, who cares, right? <laughs> and then in the middle, you have collaboration. Now. When you're putting down a boundary for your child, define yourself and not the child. So you say, I am unhappy with all the toys and, f and clothes on the floor. So what I would like would be for you to pick them up. And then the child goes, oh, oh, no, 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 like that. And you go, seems to be a bit of a problem here. What's the problem? Now, I know you think this takes ages, <laughs> but it, believe me, it, it saves time in the long run. So you say, seems to be a bit of a problem. Are you unhappy because it was your friend that made the mess and not you, so it doesn't seem fair? Does it feel very overwhelming at the beginning of a big job? You go, okay, well, I'm sorry it feels unfair, but I'm not happy with a... With a dirty room, so it still has to be done. What is it that's overwhelming about it? And they might say something like, I can put the toys away, but I don't like folding clothes. It's too hard. So then you go, oh, I see. You put the toys away, then come and get me, and we can find out a way of how to fold clothes together, and we can do that together. And the point here really isn't about getting a tidy room. The point here is learning how to collaborate and cooperate rather than getting into standoffs, and we both need to learn it. We all learn how to behave conveniently at different times, and to behave conveniently, we need certain skills, and they are flexibility, a tolerance for frustration, empathy, and problem-solving skills. And when you get into a thing when you want something to happen, these are the skills you need to be encouraging rather than, say, obedience. So that's tolerance for frustration, flexibility, problem-solving skills, and empathy. Kids learn empathy by being shown empathy. 
That's how you pick it up or you don't pick it up. Some people don't pick it up, but if they've got the other three skills, that should have them in good stead. Now, just like some people learn, I, some people can walk when they're six months, other people don't stand on their feet until they're 18 months old. Some people can read age two, I couldn't read till I was nine. We all learn these skills that we need to behave well at different times and at different stages along our lives. And what we need is to show tolerance, is to show problem-solving skills, is, is to show our flexibility, and then the kid will learn and pick up from us these skills. Okay, now then, I think I might be getting ready for some questions. Um, well, we should have two microphones, roving microphones, I think. But maybe you could start us off, Jane, Can with a question. Off? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, one question I would like to ask is, I have really enjoyed this book, and it has made me think a lot. Um, this might be a defensive question, but I remember um, when I just had one child, yeah. one little girl, I spent more time talking to her and playing with her than I did when I had three young children, and memories of the three young children include the school run, trying to get three of them into the car. Mm. The, the, the little boy in the middle regarded a car seat as something for sumo wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, we get them in, all was going well, and the eldest would say, I forgot, the teacher said we have to bring a picture of something beginning with qu. <laughs> and the whole thing would unravel. What begins with qu? Oh, I'm I have no idea. So, uh, Queen, I suppose. Queen, but, um, Will, yeah. Um, so, my question is, it feels harder when you've got several children of your own or other people's friends than it is when you've just got a single child to, to focus on. And each child needs an individual relationship with you, and each child, as you will know now they are grown up, will have a different relationship with you, and you will feel different in each relationship. And... Um, the first one, it feels easier because you're not pulled in lots of different directions. But if you are pulled in lots of different directions, you can say what's happening for you, you can define yourself. And that is good modelling for the children to learn how to define their own feelings and say what's happening. So you can say, OK, I'm pulled in several directions at once here. And so I'm going to take it in turns as to who I'm going to see first. I'm going to deal with Benjamin first because he is bleeding, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm going to deal with Melissa because she's been patient for so long. And then I'm, and then I'm going to deal with Godwin or whoever <laughs> the other one is. And um, next time it will be in a different order, you know, and then... They, we just have to learn patience as we learn to wait for our turn. And quite often, a way of getting parental attention is to beat the living daylights out of your brother. Have you all tried that? <laughs> it's great. So you go into the room, and they're fighting like crazy. And you say, bye. Thank you. Bye, sweetheart. Um, you go into the room and they're fighting like crazy and you say, can you stop fighting? They go, no, we all like, we like fighting. <laughs> and you go, yeah, I know you like fighting. I don't like you fighting. When you're putting down boundaries, always define yourself and not the child. So it's, like, it's not stop fighting, that's unacceptable. It's like, I don't like fighting, so you have to stop because I don't like it. None of us mind it when someone else defines themselves, but we do mind it when people define us. So when my 13-year-old said, um, I'm going to get the night bus back from Peckham to central London at 2 a.m., I'll be fine. <laughs> I say, you know what? I think you would because you're really good at the buses. One problem, I'm not fine with it. I can't let you do it because I am not ready to let you do that yet, even though you're really good at buses. You're going to have to wait for me. She goes, oh. but she can accept that I'm not ready. What she can't accept is me saying, you are no way mature enough to get the night bus on your own. Because that is really frustrating. And if I were her and I heard that, I'd fight back. 
So it's me that isn't ready, not her that isn't mature enough. That's so useful when you've got teenagers and they want to stay out late. If you go, I know you're responsible or I think you're responsible, but I'm not ready to let you do it. You have to wait for me. And it does actually make you hurry up with letting them go a bit when you realize it's your fear that's holding them back rather than their immaturity. Have you got another question for well, me? Well, you mentioned boundaries there. Yeah. Because you believe very much in respecting a child and understanding their feelings, but you do also believe that they need boundaries as a framework. Yeah, we need to respect our own boundaries. Um, in order for a child to understand that boundaries are okay, they need to see how we put down boundaries too. So we respect their boundaries by saying, I'm going to pick you up now rather than just swooping them up. And we get them to respect our boundaries because we keep self-defining. Because if we, do, if we say eight o'clock is bedtime and that's that, they'll say, but dad lets me stay up till nine. So it's not that, is it? So you let me stay up till eight, dad lets me stay up to nine, who's right? Now we know this isn't a question of who's right. We know this is a question of who's the tiredest. <laughs> <laughs> so what you can say is you define yourself. That's right, Dad does let you stay up to nine and I want you to go to bed at eight because I want to go to bed and I can't go to bed until I put you to bed. You don't say you have to go to bed now because you're tired. Who wants to be told they're tired? We know what we're feeling, nearly. So define yourself and not the child. And then the child can understand, oh, Mum wants me to go to bed at eight because she's tired. Dad wants me to go to bed at nine because he doesn't want to walk an antiques road trip alone or whatever it is. Um, we all have personal reasons for putting down the boundaries. Don't pretend they're objective reasons when they're not. Somebody once said to me, but I read somewhere that it's wrong and bad for a child to have more than two hours screen time a day. Therefore, it is an objective truth. No, it isn't. Some children can watch five-hour screen without losing their creativity or their sociability, and some can't really cope with more than half an hour. So what you say is, I'm not comfortable with having that screen on any longer, so I'm going to turn it off in five minutes. We don't say, you've had enough, because that is demeaning and disrespectful. You can put the boundary down just before you reach your limit. Now, your limit is when you lose it, and no kid wants their parent to lose it. So put your boundary down, even if it's kind of like quite a low down boundary. If your limit is here, it's better to be kept safe than having a parent explode on you. There's no right or wrong about where your boundaries are. They're dictated to you by your own feelings. You are allowed your feelings as a parent, and you are allowed to put your boundary down before your feelings become intolerable to you. And it's important that you do. Was that clear? Very clear. Can okay, I have one, one small question, then we'll go to the audience. Okay. You mentioned, well, arguing. All adults argue and all parents argue, <laughs> but you stress how you argue has a big impact on the environment in which your child grows up. Yeah. So how do we argue well? How do we argue well? <laughs> yes. <laughs> We argue well by using our feelings and getting to know the feelings of our, let's call them our opponent, a little bit dangerous, partner, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and what we can do, which is wrong, is play fact tennis. So... Suppose we're having an argument about doing the washing up. I've done the washing up, I've left the kitchen pristine, I've gone to work, I've come back to my creative husband who has had a load of snacks, had some friends round, and left the kitchen in a complete and utter tip, right? So there's a few ways I can deal with this. I can play fact tennis. I can say, you, this is a bloody mess, it's disgusting, it's unhygienic, clear it up. 
as you go along. And you'll go, no, 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 I'm leaving it until the end of the day because it's a better use of my time to do the washing up all in one. And I will go, yes, but that's unhygienic because it's attracting flies. So we've gone from, we're 15 all, I've just got to 30, 15. And he'll go, I think you'll find it's winter and there are no flies. <laughs> 30 all. And then I can say, it's all dried on and it's hard. It's too difficult to get off now. It's much easier if you do it up. 40, 30. Anyway, you know, we'll go on until somebody runs out of reasons. And the one with the most reasons then wins the match. <laughs> but at the expense of the person they love most in the world. So that is not a good example of arguing. It's much better if we talk about not facts about the washing up, because they will go on forever. We can even get into you know, a five set match if we're not careful. Let's just go straight to feelings and save a lot of time. So it's, my heart sinks when after I've left the kitchen in the morning, it's all untidy when I get back. It makes me feel despondent and sad. And I've said that to someone I love, right? And, and they love me too. They go, oh, I don't want you to be sad. I'm sorry I haven't done it. I've just been so busy today, I haven't thought. Shall we do it together now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because we, if we're fighting and angry, we're, we're, sh we're not showing the vulnerable parts of ourselves. If we go, this makes me feel this, and they say, well, this makes me feel that, then you can sort of weigh the feelings up and not prioritise one person's feelings over somebody else's feelings, pretending it's to do with facts. It's so much better whether we're talking to our partners, our parents, our children, if when we, we've got a difference, we find out about that difference and we find out about the feelings behind that difference so we all understand each other. And that sometimes we will have to compromise and take turns and wash up twice a day when it's not our turn. <laughs> but we're doing, when we're doing it out of love, it's a lot easier than when we're doing it out of winning and losing. Do not get into winning and losing battles with your, with your partner or with your kids. Um, there's a whole section on how to have a different dynamic in the book rather than winning and losing. <laughs> I hope Fantastic that helps. Fantastic advice, lovely. Let's go to the audience. Um, we've got two roving microphones. Who's brave? Oh, there's, there's a, a brave hand person hand over there. here. Fantastic. Thank you very much. If you could just, just wait till the mic's with you, that would be great. Thank you. Hello, Philippa. Um, my six-year-old was doing really well this morning. He got himself dressed, more or less, ate all his breakfast, and then he suddenly drew the line when I said, okay, would you go and brush your teeth? And he made a loud screeching noise for about 20 seconds. Yeah. Um, it seems to be about, I don't want to be alone brushing my teeth. I, I don't like being... No, I don't want to be alone when I brush my teeth. No, what I'm you, only what's six. What's going on? I'm only six. Um, so, Euston, we have a problem with the teeth brushing. <laughs> what seems to be the problem? And you found out what the problem is. I'm having such a great time at breakfast with you guys. I don't want to go off on my own. So what can we do to solve the problem? Let's brainstorm together, because what we mustn't do is fix it for kids, because they are capable of fixing the problems on their own. So we go, what can we do? What great ideas have you got? And then what's his name? Keir. Keir will say, why can't we keep our toothbrushes in the kitchen and then I wouldn't have to be on my own? And you go, I don't have a problem with toothpaste in the sink. Do you have a problem with toothpaste in the sink, mummy? <laughs> so then mummy and Kia will have to fight it out as to whose feelings are stronger, loneliness, toothpaste in the sink. I'm sure they're going to figure it out. I hope for Kia's sake that he gets his <coughs> teeth cleaning done in the kitchen so he doesn't have to be on his own. And maybe you'll need another set for the bathroom. But he, he will find out the solution on his own. When, we've got a pro when the kids come to us with a problem, we're so grown up, we know all the solutions. But it's so important for them to find their own solutions. So when they come to you in the playground going, nobody will play with me in the playground. We want, right, I'm going around to the school with a machine gun and I'm going to kill, 
I am going to kill all those other children until they learn to play with you. So what we do instead is find out what happened. What do you mean by nobody? M M Melissa and Bronwyn won't play with me. And they're your favourites, aren't they? So that must be really painful if they won't play with you. So what can you do? And then when they find their solution of, I suppose I could play with Jeremy, <laughs> you go, yeah, try that. Because maybe he's feeling left out too, or something like that. Let them come up with the solution. And when they've come up with the solution, they're much more likely to want to do with it. If you go straight away, well, play with Jeremy then. It's not going to work. They have to find their solution in order to embody it. Have we got another question now? Oh, yep. oh we've got one right in the front here that I can see. This lady here in, oh, leopard skin. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, right to the mic, mic, mouth of the mic. We are looking for tips on how to deal with separation anxiety in a three-year-old who has just started nursery yeah. and has a five-month-old baby. Oh, so, there's so a lot wait a on. minute. If I go to nursery, mummy and the baby are <coughs> <laughs> having time without me. You know, what you have to do, which is feels so counterintuitive, is that you have to steer into the skid. In Scotland, I know you have icy roads, and I know you all know if you get into a skid, it's no use pushing the wheel in the other direction because the car will keep on going in, the in that direction. And what we tend to do with our kids when they're doing something we don't want them to do is steer into the other direction straight away. Like, you're going to have a lovely time at nursery. Doesn't work. Hello, baby. Hi. Doesn't like my talk, that baby. Um, so what you have to do is steer into the skid. So that means you have to name the unnameable. You have to name the unmentionable. When you're at nursery, are you worried that I'm... Are you jealous that your brother or sister? Brother? Sister. Sis, your sister has got me all to herself. That must be very hard for you. What shall we do about that? I don't want to go to nursery. I'm sorry, you have to go to nursery. I, Daddy has to go to work, I have to go to work, we all have to go to work, you have to go to work, it's time. <laughs> <laughs> so what else can we do to make you feel better? Why can't I have some alone time with mummy? That's a good idea. When daddy comes home, he's going to look after your sister and you and I are going to go for a little walk, just us two. Because what he wants is alone time with you. And if he knows he's going to have it, even if it's just 10 minutes, he'll have that. He'll feel heard. So that's why you have to name the unmentionable. And the unmentionable is, you don't like the idea of me having alone time with your sister. Is that what it is? I mean, it might be, no, I just hate going to school. And then you go, God, I used to hate going to school too. You and me both, babe. And then you have that moment of connection. Because that's what he's looking for, is a moment of connection. And that's what you want with, his, with, with him right now, is a moment of connection. And you'll think you'll get it when he does what you want. And he will do what you want, because he wants to be on your side. But he's also got these really big feelings that need looking at. So my tip is, steer into the skid. Thank you. Thank great, you. Great tip. There's a, a hand straight back. This same section, uh, a, a white, white shirt. Thanks very much. Hi, thank you. Um, it's actually a follow-up from Jane's earlier question about um, distributing attention between your children. So yeah. you have three, but rather than just in the moment, it's more when there's prolonged periods of one of them needing you. So we have a nearly teen. Yeah. We've just moved, hauled the whole family up to Scotland. And she's demanding a lot of my attention at the moment. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to neglect the other two. Yeah. They're not necessarily complaining about it, okay. but she's wanting me all the time. It sounds like you're worried. If you were one of those other children, those happy-go-lucky ones that you've got, as well as the one that needs a lot of attention, you'd feel jealous that you were giving so much to the eldest. 
but we all have different needs at different times. And I think if you are 10, 11, your friendships at that time are so strong and they've just been ripped because you've moved. And so she will have, he, she, he, she, she, she will yeah. have bigger needs right now because she's got more relational needs at that age than say a five-year-old or a six-year-old has when they're sort of like, ooh, sandpit. <laughs> she's beyond, ooh, sandpit. She's more about connection and she had that connection with her old school friends and now she's got to start again and break into established groups and that's really hard. So she will need a lot of your support and you're doing the right thing by giving it to her. And you can say, what's her name? Rosie. You can say, Rosie needs a lot of mummy time right now. I'll get to you two later. You can say that if it makes you feel better, but if they're not showing any signs of distress, you're just doing everything right and don't worry about being fair. Sometimes our children will ask this question. Mummy, who do you love best? <laughs> and you'll be horrified and you'll go, I love you as, as to the work, to the moon and back, both of you, the same, the same. And they know you're lying. <laughs> because we don't love anybody the same and they can feel that. So you love John like you love John. You love Mary like you love Mary. You feel different when you're with Mary because she's playful and laughs a lot and makes you laugh. And you feel different when, when you're with John because he's still waters run deep. And he comes out with the most surprising observation that make go, oh! So you love them very much and you love them differently, like you love everybody in your family differently. But that doesn't mean to say you wouldn't miss them terribly if one of them went. So as well, sometimes one child will need more attention than another child for whatever reason, for whatever reason they're going through. But you still love John like you lo love John, Mary like you love Mary, and Rosie like you love Rosie. And we mustn't ever say, I love you the same, out of sheer panic that one of them's going to feel less loved. Because we don't love them the same, we love them differently, but that's not necessarily more or less. Thank you, that's a great question, thanks. Thank you. Any more? Hand just up here Oh, well. goody. Yeah. Thank you, the microphone's just coming. Oh, we found one there. Thank you. Um, we live in an incredibly busy and stressful world. And as you mentioned at the start, often sometimes it's uh, difficult to parent because you're in a stressful situation. Yes. Um, I found myself become a much better parent since I practice meditation and mindfulness. And I wondered what your thoughts were on creating space in order to be the kind of parent that you're um, talking about being. Well... We do need to know what it is we're feeling in order to put our boundaries down before our feelings become intolerable. So it is necessary to have some self-reflection. And sometimes, if you're a single parent of five children, you can't do that alone. You need help. And there's a whole bit in the book about um, exercise to, uh, to know how well supported you are and how to get more support. And you need to continue. It's not just when you have a new baby you need support. You need support. It does take a village to raise a child. And if just because we don't talk over the fence like we used to, uh, it doesn't mean to say we don't need to find a community that is there for us when we need extra help. And, um, you know, whatever we need to do, to um, find that time to know what it is we're thinking and we're feeling, we need to do it. I mean, you can call it mindfulness. I call it watching property programs in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> we all have different ways of getting what we need. Um, that's what I used to do, actually. I, um, I used to work from seven o'clock in the morning. My husband used to do the mornings. And I used to stop at about two I used to have an hour's television before I did the school pickup. <laughs> I, it's what I needed just to sort of like, oh, you know, that me time. But if you do it mindfulness or meditation, 
then that's good too. In fact, better, probably. <laughs> uh, any more questions? Somebody over there? Is a lady there? Race to her, see you can get there first. Hello. Um, Hello. You listed some ingredients that were really important, like empathy and tolerance of frustration. And I was wondering if you had any advice on building that tolerance for frustration. It's something we really struggle with in our household. Um, it's good to name it. Um, it's we are we emotions are sort of man-made in a way because we are only born with okay, not okay. And then the others evolve in culture and language. But the more we can name those emotions, the more we can sort of own and possess them. So if we've got words for them or drawings for them, we can take control of them. So it's quite a good idea if you could get your child to maybe draw their frustration. And then they've got another way of expressing it rather than stamping and screaming. Um, and my favourite sort of um, childlike uh, frustration is when a child gets teenage because they start to separate from you. And um, it's as a, as a psychotherapist, when I felt so sorry for my kid because when she was teenage and she swore at me to F off, mum, although she said the, the real word, didn't want to upset anybody. She didn't care if she upset me. <laughs> F off, mum. And I went, oh, darling, you're separating. <laughs> <laughs> Poor kid. What they need me to do is go, <gasps> oh, you know. Um, so that's, that's not how to do it. It's good to take feelings seriously. So I can see you're really frustrated. Yes, I can see you're picking up the bricks and throwing them through the greenhouse. Yes. Um, just like we learn to read at different speeds, we learn to tolerate frustration at different speeds. And um, some t they won't always be in free fall, triggered tantrum mode. So when they're not in tantrum mode, it's a good idea to think about what the triggers are, because they're not always like that. So what are the triggers that lead to these bouts of frustration? And can we talk about them? Hey, we've got a problem. How can we brainstorm this? Can we talk about them so that they can learn to get more control? It's sort of like, how would I learn to f tolerate my frustration and think about how your kid will learn to do it? We all learn it in time, except for Sometimes I don't, but you know, we all have slip-ups. Um, good question, thank you. Can we one more question, but it'll have to be um, sh short, please, just in the middle of this central section. Thank you very much. Oh, it's going there. It's just about how we navigate devices. I've got uh, I've two boys, six and eight. They, ha they are growing into a world where devices will have been <laughs> an everyday part of, and even you know, at school, quite a lot of the maths and so, English, um, et cetera, is taught that it, way. It's so sort of like, instead of there being you, your two boys and you, there seems to be so many more people in this relationship because there's all these devices. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. It's sort of like and iPhones the games and they iPads. Play and addictive, and yeah. The and games they play on them are addictive. So. Um, PS1 and, and yeah. all of that. Um, you sound like you've got a low tolerance for those things. If I had a low tolerance for them, what I would do is say, I am not happy with you playing PS1 the whole time, so we are going to look for tadpoles in the woods. No, you can't take them. <laughs> yes, you're really angry about that. Yes, we're going. Um, it's, a real sh it's, it's not the devices themselves that are so harmful. It's what they're not doing when they're on them. They're not being creative. They're not being sociable. They're not finding out about the real world. They're not getting muddy with tadpoles. They're um, not shoplifting. <laughs> it's what they're not doing when they're on them. So that it, I think it can sort of change how they're sociable. But you know, some kids have been on screens practically all their lives, and they are now brilliant coders or games writers or... 
it, if you just feel like you're, you're losing your child to the device, just put your boundary down before you limit. I'm not comfortable with, so I'm taking that away. And there will be fallout. He said, yes, that's exactly what it was like when your father gave up cigarettes. He felt as frustrated because that's what addiction is. You know, you, we can talk about it. Uh, I think it's a really big problem. And I think once we've got this a dialogue with our children established, once they feel any feeling they feel is acceptable, then we're able to have those difficult conversations where we turn ourselves inside out, exploring what we feel about something, be it devices, be it computer use, be it pornography, be it um, how people have relationships, you know, really difficult conversations. We can have them so much more easily when we've allowed dialogue to take place rather than do it and done to. If our kid is... Um, uh, like 11, and we haven't really been talking to them with to and fro and being there for them, we can't suddenly start dictating to them because they won't take it. But if we've kept collaboration and dialogue going, it's a lot easy, easier. And if we haven't, we have to re-establish it um, because we all have times when we feel apart in relationships and then come back together again. So all is not lost, and we can always repair and amend any misattunements we've had in our relationship. There's no such thing as ruining it. We can always, we all make mistakes and we can always get back on track. And I have to stop there, don't I? I shall be signing books wherever I do that and I hope to see any of you that have still not bought my book <laughs> in the bookshop. Thank you. Okay, did we go out that way? Yeah. Okay. The signing tent is...